Hello and welcome to today's session, the second part in our risk adequacy series, hosted by CalcuRisk and ComplyPort. My name is Jonathan Greenstein. I'm joined today by Gerard Joyce, Chief Technology Officer and Director of Risk Management within CalcuRisk, and Richard Revel, Associate Director and Risk Lead from ComplyPort. Quick bit of housekeeping. On your screen, you should see a button that allows you to submit questions towards the bottom of the screen titled Q&A. Please do so as and when you have um, one. We'll save all questions and answer them for, um, after the form presentation. I will now pass across to Richard, who will introduce you to today's session. Good morning, everybody. Um, welcome back to those who joined us for the first session, um, and welcome to those who are, who are new on this second session. Um, last session, we... Um, just, just start. Right. I'm looking at control here, Johnny. Got a slight problem. Yeah, I know you've got control. Just good click, click screen, um, turns into a screen um, slideshow. Okay. Yes, I'm not actually seeing this. Bear with me, please. Um, Sorry, I'll do it here on my side. There you go. Okay, I'm not actually going forward and back here, Johnny. Okay, um, set up a, so do it this way instead then. Okay. Okay, sorry for that, recapping. Um, I'm now going to move through in uh, standard edit view. We're having some technical problems with the, uh, with the slideshow, as you can see. Um, in the last session, we dealt with why a firm would wish to implement a risk management framework. Um, we looked at uh, trends that ComplyPort has seen um, within, the, uh, within the domain of ICAP, certainly the, the higher regulated firms, um, and uh, the SCA's um, focus towards far more rigorous risk-based analysis within the Pillar 2 risk area of ICAP. Um, and we had also looked at the consultation paper from the middle of this year, CP1920, um, which was effectively uh, signaling that the FCA would want to be able to request from all firms evidence that there was a risk management framework in place, and that's all regulated firms, um, all the way from uh, the uh, full scope 730s at the top down to uh, down to consumer credit firms and the like, slightly further down the, uh, the regulatory risk spectrum. Um, in this session, we're going to look a bit more at how to implement a uh, risk management framework. Um, we're going to go through the various components that you would need um, to assemble and uh, explore some of the concepts which, uh, which join together to form a framework. Um, I've put a sort of very brief agenda in here. Um, we have a, a risk attitude piece. Um, we're going to look at risk vocabulary. Uh, the dreaded risk appetite. We're going to look at risk register and how to construct that and how it links back to the overall uh, risk attitude. Um, we're going to briefly touch on risk controls um, and then we're going to talk about pulling it all together and using it both for um, ICAP, um, a sort of more monolithic and static um, exercise, and then look at how it can be used or how you would implement it to use on a day-by-day -day basis within a, within a firm. So I'm going to start off with the uh, concept of risk attitude. Um, risk attitude is the board's view of what, what they want to happen. It is the approach that, um, that a firm will take towards risk. Um, the ISO, which is the International Organization for Standardization out of Geneva, defines risk attitude rather wordly as the organization's approach to assess and eventually pursue, retain, take or turn away from risk. Um, boiled down, uh, this is, this is a, a description of how the board or the managing partners would want the firm to direct itself, um, where it would want the, uh, the firm to take on board risk, um, just how risk averse it may be in certain areas, um, and uh, provides almost a map or blueprint to the executive management on the way they should be running their facets of the business. 
Um, clearly, you know, people would wish to uh, wish to minimise risk, but right at the outset, we should accept the fact that there is no zero risk way of running a business. Um, if you wanted zero risk, you should just not run a business. Um, so that's a, that's the bold start. Um, you may aspire to zero risk in certain areas. You may have a, a very low tolerance to risk, um, but ultimately, it is simply not achievable. So. To start, um, well, the first thing I'd like to look at is the concept of risk vocabulary. Now, the FCA, when ICAP um, first started, produced a prescriptive template for smaller and medium firms, which held a series of risk categories within it. And these risk categories are also to be found in um, one of the returns, the uh, so-called Pillar 2 return, FSA 019. Um, these categories are very often taken as read or as gospel by firms. Um, in fact, it's not really the, the, the right way to approach this. The way I would say um, you should approach this, because you know the inside of your business far better than anyone else, is to put together your own risk vocabulary, your own categories. Um, these could include, I mean, I've, I've put some uh, jumbled up examples down there, um, but it very much may, you know, it, it, it very much depends on uh, the nature of the business you're in. Um, some firms will not be exposed to uh, model risk because possibly they're not doing algorithmic trading. Other firms may be uh, may be much more sensitive to say reputational risk because they are they are retail facing and uh, and derive a lot of their business from advertising. Um, so I would, I would basically advise a firm to build its own risk vocabulary and then map that risk vocabulary across to the um, FCA more recognized categories. Um, this is simply so that uh, should the regulator come knocking for any reason, you're presenting risks in the language of the FCA, um, but they can then see through that to, uh, to your own categorization and your own work in the background there. So effectively, build your own risk vocabulary, record it. This avoids ambiguity down the line. Different firms will uh, simply have slightly different culture, different, um, different language for, uh, for the risks they face. Um, the next piece uh, that needs to be addressed um, is risk capacity. Um, Again, there is a, an official definition of this. Um, I put up one from the uh, Financial Stability Board, uh, which is an international body that monitors and makes recommendations about financial system. It was set up after, uh, after 2008. Um, and one of its mandates is to monitor and advise on best practice in meeting regulatory standards. And uh, Certainly in, in the environment we have at the moment, the regulatory environment we're uh, inhabiting, um, this is a very strong push towards risk management. So risk capacity is the largest hit your firm can survive. Um, in FSB stake, this is the maximum level risk the institution can assume given its level of resources before breaching. Um, now, because you have capital adequacy, liquidity adequacy, um, and a number of other constraints, the firm would cease to be able to operate within the regulatory environment far before its bank accounts and capital ran absolutely dry. So there is this concept that there is a certain financial stress level that the firm can take. There is a maximum level. And that is, if you like, a, a, a peg in the ground about which the rest of the risk attitude will be, um, will be attached or arranged. Um, what we will generally advise is that this can be pinned as, a, as possibly a, um, a multiple of um, your yearly turnover or capital, profit or cash of bank. I mean, these, these, are, um, these are fairly standard um, key performance indicators or measures. Um, and that will aid in any financial projection work um, within ICAP. But for the, for the uh, purposes of this argument, we're simply looking for a large number at which point the firm is not viable. Um, it has been a catastrophic hit. It should also be pointed out that um, what, is, what is used as a measure could also change over a firm's lifestyle. 
sorry, life cycle. Um, you know, a, a startup firm, it may simply be capital. A startup may not actually be generating profit, but for an established business, this may be a multiple of profit. And again, this 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 really is down to the um, the governing body to decide. It's, it's as I say, a, a peg upon which we can start hanging the other concepts. Now, clearly, uh, that number will be subject to uh, possibly some uncertainty. Um, and there is a side concept to this called risk management capability. Um, and this is the, if you like, it's, it's how accurately the firm or how confidently the firm can predict that capability, that capacity number. Um, it's, it's a gauge of uncertainty or it's a gauge of um, how experienced the firm is. Um, what its culture is, uh, the controls and the measures that you have in place. So this is a, a you know, if you like a, a, a an adjustment um, figure almost, just to uh, just to ascertain how accurately you think your risk capacity figure is um, is uh, reached. Um, risk appetite. Well, risk appetite is uh, basically the you know the uh, the amount and type of risk that you're willing to pursue or retain it's um it's it's the business as usual figure we all accept that there will be um risk events which crystallize during the year um and the risk appetite is um a measure usually a multiple of the capacity which determines um the day to day well business as usual acceptable losses through risk events occurring it's it's a measure of um you know the the uh the um day to day running of the firm i think one could look on this that the risk appetite um again if if very closely um closely measured and looked at um could also return a, a measurement of the efficiency of the firm obviously if you have a very very low appetite indeed um this restricts um, doing business, it probably restricts income. If you have too high a risk appetite, then you're you're running a, a fairly unsafe firm, I believe. What's happened now? It's just gone gone very large. Yes, can you see that, Johnny? And uh, Deal with it your end. I don't know quite what's happened. Need to need to reduce the size of the the zoom zoom out. Okay. Um, well, I'll continue talking from slides whilst um, whilst my guy has a has a look at uh, getting this back in. Uh, ah, there we go. Again, I'm not being able to use the arrow keys on this. Thank you very much, Johnny. Keep going down. And one more. No, that's that's a slide. Go up, on, up to. Sorry, back to. Please. Back another one. Okay, that's fine. Okay, we have um, a final. Um, concept which is the risk tolerance for a firm. Um, risk tolerances are basically splitting the risk appetite out across major risk categories um, and th this could be looked at um, breaking the firm down into uh, business aspects or facets, um, areas where risk will, um, will come in. Um, the idea here is that having got a, an overall risk appetite figure, the, uh, the single figure which governs uh, the risks that you're, you're willing to take on board, um, you can then split the tolerances out against categories. And the categories may well be um, you know, key person risk, or it may well be um, people risk, or it may well be operational systems risk. Um, these various areas need to, be, um, need to be lumped out, and you need to look at the tolerances for those areas. Um, a good example quite often is um, financial crime. It could well be that a firm has zero tolerance for financial crime. This is, a, this is an aspirational view. Um, it knows there will be some, some cost involved or related to financial crime because you have to keep checking things that may be false positives um, within the system that, uh, that need shaking out. 
um, but risk tolerance is, if you like, our, our final, um, our final uh, concept to take on board. Um, if we go to the next slide, I'm going to hand over to uh, Gerard, who has a, a very nice analogy for um, these concepts of capacity and, uh, and tolerances and appetite. So, Gerard, would you uh, back one? We go to the glass. Uh, thank you, Richard. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, yeah, this is a concept that I, that I've used for for a number of years. If the if the rule is that you have to keep all glasses of water on the table, and this glass of water complies with that rule, but uh, certainly the risk is high, my appetite is that all glasses of water should be kept ten inches in from the edge of the table, and that is in. in when I try to explain risk appetite and, and capacity, I would say that the edge of the table is the capacity of the organization, the table to carry the glass of water, but the appetite is some bit in from the edge. Now you need to know your capacity so you can determine, well, how close to the edge do you want to go? And you might describe that as your, your tolerance, but um, first understand your, your capacity. Okay. Uh, my parents can you, you once mentioned also that the, uh, the capability comes into this uh, metaphor by someone entering the, the, the room and the lights are off. Yes, the, the capability is, is that operational environment that was part of the, the FSB's description of, of um, uh, capacity. Uh, if you're new to the business and inexperienced and you have untested processes and procedures, then you can see your capacity capacity is, is less. Um, if, if the lights are off in the room and you've got the glass of water in your hand and you don't know where the edge of the table is, then it's, you can see how, um, how difficult it would be to stay compliant. So I suppose capability uh, is about having some light as well, having some, uh, removing that fog of war and being able to see. And that comes from experience, I think. A lot comes from experience and, and well-tested procedures. Uh, I'm going to see if I can advance this uh, down arrow. No. I'm going to have to ask uh, Jonathan to. Okay. I think this is this is one of uh, Richard's um, a slide showing the um, um, how the risk attitude, how um, for individual uh, aspects of the business. Um, I see here is key, key person up at, at eight and the um, perhaps Richard you might um, just really yes, first. absolutely. Um, this basically links together the concepts that we've covered and the work rather, I think, nicely illustrated by the, the glass and table analogy in that um, at the top of the, um, of the table, you can see we've got a, the concept of the domain, which is, which is the whole firm. This is a, this is a, a, a sort of a simpler um, Excel assembly as we can uh, meaningfully put together. Um, and this particular firm, um, its risk capacity has been uh, very roundly and very accurately um, determined as being one million, um, presumably sterling. Um, and the metric there is one year's profit. Um, this particular Excel sheet is, is um, part of a feeder that, uh, that we use to, uh, to generate um, Pillar 2 provision. Um, we've set our appetite ratio to capacity at 20%, which gives us an overall appetite of 200,000. Um, and then as a separate exercise, we go through the business aspects or categories um, and the board or, or partners of the firm will allocate scoring, in this case out of, um, out of 10, um, to the various aspects. And as I mentioned before, a firm may well have a zero tolerance towards financial crime, um, but on the other hand, this particular firm doesn't seem to worry too much about its, um, its key people. Um, in that it's fairly open to running key person risk. Um, this then is, is split out um, you know, on, a, on a simple scalar from the appetite and gives each of these aspects a, a nominal figure through the year, um, which the firm is um, accepting of uh, you know, opening itself to the risk of these amounts. So we're looking at um, you know, the, the key person risk, for instance, um, we're looking at almost £50,000 worth of um, 
firing or hiring new people there um, and the firm would be operating within its own perceived uh, comfort zone um, as, as described by this um, risk attitude piece. Um, I've also put in a threshold there. Um, that's a, a useful uh, measure which basically is, is rather like a, a red, amber, green signal um, to executive management. So if, if during the year you're on track to exceed um, in this case, it's 75% of the tolerance. This is a trigger for management action to bring things under control. Clearly, controls aren't working. Um, there are problems possibly with mitigants. It's, it's basically a signal that um, the aspirational risk attitude, the risk appetite and tolerances are not being met by the firm as it, um, as it proceeds through the year. Um, if we can go on to the next slide. Okay, um, now we have effectively finished off, or the firm will now have finished off this description of its risk attitude. This is the, the approach it wishes to take to risk. It's, it's aspirational, what we want to happen. Um, there is a separate exercise now, which may be more familiar to people, which is that of the risk register or risk matrix assembly. Um, and this is where you approach the um, problem of how risk um, sits within the firm from the ground up. The, the aspirational view is very much a top-down approach. Um, by building from the ground up, from the, uh, the shop floor, or at least from the operational experience of, um, of management, um, you can then hopefully bring the two together and see how they match. So, what we're looking at now is effectively a risk assessment. The risks within the various, various categories are going to be listed or enumerated, um, and they're going to be analyzed from the point of view of their likelihood, by how often uh, we would expect these, uh, these unfortunate events to occur, and also from the point of view of um, the consequences of these. Um, across in ICAP land, often the word impact is used there, but consequences is slightly wider and, uh, and I think a bit more meaningful. Um, so let's look at the, uh, the next slide. So the next thing to do or to um, explain out or, or deconstruct is, is the concept of risks and risk drivers. Um, the risk drivers are the events that underpin a certain risk. So obviously experience will aid in this, um, but we could look at a, a very straightforward example. We, we have the risk of um, your being denied access to your premises. Um, I've got it down as premises denial here, um, which is a little bit of a, a buzz phrase, but basically this is the risk that you cannot get into the office or offices. Um, it sits within a category of operational risk, um, but the risk drivers that could lead to you being denied access to your premise are disparate. They can be things like power outage, they could be fire, they could be a break-in, they could be environmental issues. Um, some of these are more predictable than others. Um, we had a, a case of comply court where we were denied access to premises, um, and that was because the um, late Russian journalist, Mr. Litvinenko, visited on the day when he was uh, poisoned with polonium. Now, clearly that's not a risk driver we could ever have predicted, um, whereas power outage is, is a, far more, uh, a far more common event. But nevertheless, it contributed to a crystallized of the risk of premises denial. So this is the concept that the risk still remains roughly the same, but the risk drivers are possibly different. Um, now the level of detail with which you, um, you look at risks will again probably be driven by the size and complexity of the firm. Proportionality uh, applies in here as well. Um, and it should also be remembered that the, uh, this is a, a dynamic and living list. Um, again, through the firm's life cycle, um, you know, internal or external circumstances could lead to uh, some risks cropping up which hadn't been, a, hadn't been um, an issue previously, the previous year, simply because maybe the business has taken on um, a new business line or, um, or has employed a, a different department or has new functionality within it. Um, so if we can look at the next slide, um, let's examine the, the components of a risk. 
Now, this becomes very much more list-like, as you can see. Again, we're, we're basing this within an Excel model. And there is the idea that when you have identified a risk, um, in this case, it's a, a, a bad creditor risk, um, it has what could be regarded as an inherent likelihood or an inherent consequence. This is if you're not doing anything to control this risk, you're not doing anything to mitigate this risk, what are the problem, what, what is the hit here, how likely is it, and what is the, uh, what is the consequence on a scoring one to five. We can then look at the controls that the firm has in place to control this risk. Um, in this case, we've got the idea of uh, credit checks um, and DD work on boarding a client. Um, timely monitoring is, is another good, um, good check on a, on a risk. And staff training so that they're aware that this sort of thing could happen, you know, the, the awareness side of it. Um, and then you get through to do uh, what some would be calling its residual likelihood and residual consequence. The consequence in this particular model case may well be the same, but the likelihood has been reduced through the fact that we're, um, we're looking to uh, run credit checks on people before we, uh, before we work with them. Um, and ultimately, um, and possibly uh, across the board, um, we can then boil this down to a, a single figure, uh, which can be a residual score. Um, and if we have a, a, a little, well, we'll, we'll revisit the, the score in a, a couple of slides time. Um, but let's have a look at the next slide and have a quick look at uh, consequence and likelihood. Um, what we have here is a scaling, um, and for each firm, um, there will be clearly different different numbers in here. Um, the likelihood ones are fairly, um, fairly, fairly nailed down. We, we view it um, as once a year, once every two years, once every five years. These are fairly gross measures, but we are dealing with um, somewhat uncertain uh, predictions here. And we can allocate a percentage to that, which is a scalar, which we can apply back to um, the, uh, the consequence. And you will be able to start seeing how, how you know, a, a very large risk, which happens very seldom, could rank somewhere on the uh, urgency list or score list with something that has uh, fairly low risk but happens a lot more often. Um, and it's at this point that we can start within this fairly um, introductory model also introducing some quantification, some actual financial penalties for what a significant event might mean to the firm, what a substantial event might mean, um, and uh, what would be regarded as negligible. Again, very much dependent on the size of the firm um, and, uh, and its, 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 its business, um, business volumes. Um, if we can hit uh, a return, I think there's a small graphic to the side on this slide which should come up next. No, we've gone back one. Um, and this gives uh, a, a concept of a heat map. Um, it's a very easy to read idea. Basically, um, risks you do not want to be running within the firm um, will appear in the red area top right. Um, you know, no, no firm would want something with the largest likelihood also being the, uh, the, <laughs> the, largest, uh, the largest impact. Um, and again, the, the concept of risk appetite comes back in here in that as you move back towards the lower left of this, uh, of this heat map, you're getting back into the comfort zone and by applying controls and mitigations, you are, you are attempting to crawl the risks down towards the bottom left within the, uh, within the boundary of a risk appetite. Um, I think we can go to the next slide because I've mentioned um, controls and mitigants before. Um, basically, they're, they're split into three broad categories, um, one of which is uh, prevention. Um, preventative controls are items such as um, policy, they're items such as training, they're, they're all the things that make a risk less likely to happen. Um, mitigation is, by and large, when the risk has crystallized, the event has occurred, and it's the mitigation of the impact after the event. And this is things like putting in place contingency plans. Um, BCP is a, a, a classic example of a, a wide ranging mitigant. You have the phone numbers, you know the actions, you can act very quickly when an event has occurred and hopefully limit its consequences. 
Um, in between those, there is this concept of detection. Clearly, if you haven't noticed that something's gone wrong, you can't begin to treat it, and it could very, very likely widen and uh, grow in the dark, as it were. So again, catch the risk as soon as possible. And um, last, uh, last presentation, um, we tied this into what's called the bow tie model, which is on the next, uh, the next sheet. Um, and I'll pass back to Gerard to recap his, um, his explanation of that because it's a very powerful model. Okay, uh, thank you, Richard. Now that this is a, a build sequence, so um, um, stay with me. The idea of the bow tie is, as Richard introduced, you've got preventative controls, detection and mitigation controls, and the knot on the bow tie represents where you've decided to place the, the, the risk in terms of um, a detail. If you move the knot more to the left, you will have more risks. You take employee fraud. If you, if you, um, if you wanted, move it one to the left and you have four risks. An employee fraud due to embezzlement, uh, payoff, uh, identity theft, fraudulent expense claim. Now you could make four risks or keep it in the center and say, let's, let's not have 500 risks in the organization. Let's try and do it with 50 risks, 50 or 60 risks. Because many of the controls you put in place for one of those risks also apply to the other other three. So if I can, if we can build this uh, with the prevention controls, um, please, Jonathan. And again, three times, just to save time. So these, and Richard has already mentioned, uh, you start with a policy. A policy is a control, gives direction to everybody. Procedures. Or drawn up in line with the policy uh, to say exactly how people should deal with particular situations. Training and education, these are our basic stuff. But you need to check, you need to confirm that people have understood what the control is, is and how it should operate and are they doing it uh, correctly. Other controls are authorization limits um, in, in the organization that certain people can only authorize up to certain amounts. A lot of this you are doing already. This is not new stuff. This is um, just good business practice. You may not have called it risk management, but um, but you have been doing risk management, perhaps without knowing it. Segregation of duties, strong access control, uh, all of these are preventative controls. Now, should you have fraud, uh, Jonathan, two taps, please. Will you would you know you fraud? If you have a data breach, how would you know you have a data breach? If you have well, clearly, if you have a fire, the smoke detectors will, will detect it and, and tell you you've got a fire. But something like fraud can be happening under the radar. And the first you might know about it is when a customer tells you or the auditors find something. So you need to consider these controls as well and, and put them in place and, and make sure that uh, you capture this at some stage, whatever the, whatever the risk is. Um, some are obvious when they go down. Something like a data breach is not so obvious. The Poneman Institute say it goes on for up to 200 days before organizations realize it. And that's, that's quite frightening. Um, if you do have that undesirable event, um, the employee fraud, the data breach, are you ready? Have you got a plan? And Jonathan, please. Um, because some controls you will, will come into effect basically after an event. Now it's mitigating the very clear English sense of lessening the severity of. And I've seen this many times where people, they don't like to think of those uncomfortable scenarios, maybe a data breach or fraud and don't have a plan and you lose time. And if you don't have a plan, then it can get worse before it gets better. But if you have a plan and can react quickly, uh, you can minimize the damage. So please, uh, people, have a plan. It doesn't have to be a 40-page plan. It can be a one-page plan. And if you do plans generic enough, they can apply to a lot, of, a lot of different scenarios. Think how you're going to communicate the bad news to your customers. Think how you're going to communicate to the regulator. Or you might do a privacy impact. You can do a lot of this thinking in advance and it'll save you time and pain on the day. Next slide, please, Jonathan. Okay, so uh, thanks thank very much, Sheriff. Okay. Um, so we have uh, we've looked at the idea of uh, individual risks. Um, you have worked through 
the risks that the firm faces and the end result of this particular um, methodology will be a risk register or, or risk matrix um, which will have documented the main risks that uh, the firm faces. It will document at a reasonably high level the mitigants and controls and its output as you see on the on the far right is a series of residual scores which can actually be looked at um, almost a map for management action over the next year to possibly reduce some of the uh, more uh, more impressive ones. Um, you know, obviously a score of 10 is glaring out of the red, um, and that's an infosec one. And basically, um, we would be looking to address probably the the consequences of this. Um, you know, under GDPR, it may well be that we're carrying um, data that we don't need to carry, personal data we don't need to carry. Um, perhaps we can be uh, be a bit more organised about what we keep, and therefore what the potential downside of a of a risk event occurrence will lead to. Um, and at this point, I think we we've reached pretty much the end of where Excel can get us. If we can uh, get to the next slide. Um, because what we have there is we do have um, a risk management framework, but it is fairly cumbersome. Um, it's going to sit within Excel. Um, Excel is not an easy uh, easy medium to share information in. Um, and at this point, we, we have no feedback loop. Um, this, is, this is a statement, almost a monolithic statement, of a snapshot in time of where the firm's risks are. Um, there's no... Um, you know, there's, there's, there's no mechanism in place within the firm um, that we're checking controls. Uh, there's no mechanism that incidents are being recorded and fed back into the system. Um, you know, there's, there's no way of checking that the real world is matching our expectations um, within the risk uh, the risk register, and that the risk register itself is is matching up against the uh, risk appetite that's been uh, or attitude that's been. Um, you know, expressed by the board or partners. Um, and there's really no uh, collaboration or formal workflow here. There's, there's, there's no sort of spread across the company. This, this is very much a, uh, you know, the, the sort of um, result that would be uh, owned by one person. Um, now, I'm going to again hand back to Gerard um, because there is a a final concept in this, which is a, a, a risk category that uh, isn't necessarily that well known. Um, and Johnny, if you hit the next slide, um, we can have a look at what we call spreadsheet model risk. Um, so Gerard, to you. Uh, thank you again, Richard. Yeah, spreadsheet model risk. Um, I, I wrote an article on this uh, last year, and this is, this is an excerpt from that article, if anybody's interested, um, it's on our website. Um, I first came across this this at a, a conference where a guy spoke for a half an hour on spreadsheet model risk. Now, I'm not going to speak for half an hour on it, but I realized that many people do record all of the information we spoke about, the, the appetite, the risks, the, the capacity, the, the tasks associated with uh, addressing the risk, and maybe incidents um, or risk events. And um, many people have many Excel spreadsheets and when I heard the guy speaking on a spreadsheet model risk, it, it, it did prompt me to, to write an article. Um, I, love, I love Excel and it's very useful for lists, but when it, when it is uh, to be used for risk management, there are a number of issues with it. Now, I'm go not going to read through all of these, but um, formula is obviously uh, one. If you get a formula wrong, it's not always obvious. Um, if you send a spreadsheet out to 10 people to get their input to the uh, on, on risks, you'll get 10 different uh, spreadsheets back in, in format, um, and you have to reassemble that back into the, the main document. Um, it is difficult to control who sees what in a spreadsheet, um, and you may have some sensitive information in there that is should be limited to a small number of people. Um, the integrity, the who's got the latest version, because it might be actually spread over three or four different spreadsheets. Um, you can see, uh, without me uh, belaboring it, it's, it's difficult to uh, manage a, an activity that is inherently spread across multiple people in the organization. Because I say, we are all risk managers. You have a risk officer who coordinates it, but every individual in the organization at some level is managing risk. So you need lots of people to feed into your risk register to feed the information in. 
Um, so um, consider whether uh, spreadsheet is is the best tool for you. Uh, Jonathan, please. I'm going to show you now an alternative, and it's um, it's one of many out there in the market, but I would, I'm making the case for a tool, a tool, a relational database where you can capture the information in, in one place, no copying and pasting, uh, multiple people have access at different levels. You can group your, here you see the, the uh, risk grouped by category or portfolio, and it can be by your name and by system name. Um, if we, these are 10 categories of risk, and if we take financial risks and we've moved to the, to the next slide, let's say you drill down today, I'm going to look at financial risks. And if I'm the financial controller, maybe this is the only view I have, and I'm, I don't see the technology risks or the business uh, continuity risks. So now I've got my list of risks specific to um, um, the financial side. Again, I drill down, Jonathan, and the next level of, of drilling down will bring me to the, the details on the risk. Now, if this was an Excel spreadsheet, you're talking about maybe 40 columns. Um, now you probably only need, I would say, 15 to 20 um, for most, but it's a way of capturing the details around the risk. Now, I always suggest to people rather than not just simply writing the, the um, I'll call it the risk event or the circumstances you want to avoid, uh, writing the consequences because you don't know if the person reading this fully understands what the risk is if you don't tell them what the consequences are. So premises denial is, is a shorthand for we could be denied access to our premises due to a severe weather event or a fire or, or, or a riot. And the consequence of that is that we won't be able to deliver our service to our customers and consequent loss of reputation, loss of, loss of money. And don't assume that the consequences are readily understood, captured in your, when you're describing your risk. Here you, you can see you can put in uh, inherent and residual levels of risk, you can put in the controls, you can put in the owner of the risk, and I think every risk should have an owner, and it's not always a senior person. Um, so capture the risk details, and you can see off in, in a system, you can see a button here at the top for tasks because associated with the risk might be tasks to address the risk. As Richard said earlier, when you've got your risk register, the significant ones will bubble to the top and they're the ones where you have to take action. And this is what the formalized risk management is about. It's about giving you that um, view of what, what are the important things? What do I need to address now? And if you're consistent in your assessment using the risk criteria, consistently, the most significant risks will bubble up to the top. Jonathan, please. If you moved the knot in the bow tie completely over to the left, then you will have several hundred, I would call them controls, and you won't see the wood for the trees. So I tend to encourage people to manage a risk and the controls within that risk, but I see also a need and I see people managing at the control level. So it's often a mix of both. The controls might be um, like a policy, but you, you do that maybe once and review it every year. There are other controls that you will do every month or every quarter, and it might be a, a reconciliation. It might be um, 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 checking on certain things that if you only checked it once a year, uh, you wouldn't realize it's going wrong. So in addition to the risks, you can focus on controls. And here we see controls that are linked to requirements in the SMCR, which um, on December the 9th will become very real for senior managers in organizations, um, the senior managers and certification regime. So if we drill down and control, Johnny, please. A control, and this is just an example of a control and where it comes from is COCON number four in the SMCR. You must take reasonable steps to ensure that the business of the firm complies with the relevant requirements and standards of the regulatory systems. So the control is the organization has established and maintains effective compliance function. How do you know that that's working? Well, you might write yourself a few questions of things to check on a monthly basis, quarterly basis, and associate them with that control. Now, what you're building here is, is the evidence. If you have a visit by the regulator in, in six months time, and they want to know what controls you've in place and how do you know they're working? Where's the proof? If you can't demonstrate or evidence the proof, 
then it's your word against theirs and they won't believe you. They will say, I need the evidence. Uh, next, please, Johnny. I think it's also worth pointing out at this time that um, the, uh, the control questions are very much what, um, what firms would regard as their compliance monitoring program. It's uh, split out into, uh, into direct mapping to, uh, to risks and risk categories. Um, so this is where, uh, where things start butting into uh, compliance and, uh, and the actual regulations on the other side as opposed to being so in, you know, idiosyncratic within the firm itself. Indeed, I, I say to people, if you do an assessment on the 1st of January and don't look at it again for another year, that's not risk management, that, that's risk assessment. And the management is checking uh, on a monthly, quarterly basis that the controls are working, that um, if there are events that you're recording them and maybe linking them back to the risk and saying, well, maybe that control isn't as effective as you thought, modifying the control and continuing that cycle. Now, this, this um, Last but one slide is just an example of when you have a system, you can pull information out of that system at the touch of a button that tells you uh, what the key risks are, what, what is working, what's not working, if you're recording incidents. And this is the sort of thing that you should be able to present to a regulator or indeed the board um, if asked to give the board and the regulator the reassurance that risk is being managed effectively that the controls are effective, their design and implementation. It's more difficult to do this from Excel. And uh, if, you, if you accept that in your organization that you probably are doing risk management already and it, the requirements are increasing from both the regulator and the board for a, a higher standard of managing the risk, um, you probably um, would benefit from having the tools to help you do the job um, more thoroughly. Next slide, Johnny, please. We're going to conclude on this one. I'm going to hand back to Richard, uh, maybe to, to conclude. Yes, certainly, thank, thank you very much on that one. Um, we've introduced um, a number of concepts. Um, we've introduced how those concepts tie together. We've introduced um, how they can be represented both in a, like a, a first pass risk assessment style um, and how technology can be leveraged to uh, start building a, a living system um, used on a day-to-day -day basis to, uh, to manage the internals of the business. Um, there is new vocabulary, um, but once those concepts are accurately defined, um, I would hope that they, uh, they make a, a certain amount of common sense with a, a good um, structure within uh, how things relate to each other. Um, I think the conclusions we have are that if you proceed in an orderly, um, an orderly manner by assembling the components um, in, in pretty much the order we've, uh, we've uh, shown and then revisiting them based on, uh, based on the construction of the, uh, the next block, um, you end up with a, a coherent system um, which is documented, um, that the uh, assumptions that have gone into it are documented, the, uh, the approach and appetite. Um, one can check that controls are working, um, obviously a little more uh, difficult within an Excel environment, but quite a lot of uh, monitoring programs use Excel, so, uh, so no, uh, no complete blocker there. Um, one should record events through the actual incidents um, through, through the year. Um, this allows you to go back, do a bit of analysis, see whether the consequences of those um, risk events um, matched both the expectations in the risk register and also the, the aspirations from the risk appetite. Um, and that way you can improve controls, you can lock the risks down further if necessary. Um, and uh, again, keeping information in the central location um, is, is obviously uh, a, a, a thing that generally helps most firms. Um, the idea that everyone has their own version of the same spreadsheet or the same uh, word template is, uh, is one that I'm sure everyone's familiar with. Um, but the other thing is start this, this process simply. Um, I'm often asked how many risks do we need, as if uh, the FCA has written somewhere in the handbook that uh, you know, a certain sort of firm with these permissions needs 
60 risks or whatever. Um, my view would be to start with the most obvious risks, um, start with fairly high level ones, and start simple, go end to end on these. Um, you know, the, it would be very nice to, uh, to simply have that as, as the only part of the day job, but a lot of people aren't in that position. But I think when constructing the first round, um, maybe one should just consider um, one risk a day being fully analyzed um, and uh, being, uh, being looked at and decisions made as to whether uh, there are sufficient controls there. By, by the end of the month, you will have 30 risks um, approximately. Um, and I would say for a, for a standard business, that's a very good start. You will be covering a lot of aspects of the business that way. It can always be added to, um, but what you do not want to do is give yourself something that's become so complex and unwieldy that it becomes um, unusable. Um, you know, hundreds and hundreds of risks really are not going to be usable within um, within the standard Office, um, Microsoft Office environment. Um, so yes, uh, the, the, these are the take homes I think we had. Um, I think finally, um, Johnny, would you have we have we had any questions in? No. Is Johnny on mute? Okay, well, I can uh, I can go through. Hello, I can go I, through. I can, I can uh, see. I can see one question, uh, Richard. Um, yes. You have distilled capacity and appetite down to one number. Couldn't you apply different capacities and appetites to different parts of the business? That's um, a good point. Um, yes, absolutely, certainly. Um, the reason why we did the distillation was to try and keep the, uh, the model simple, um, you know, re reduce the complexity of the model from the point of view of introducing it to people. Um, but there's absolutely no reason why a more sophisticated approach couldn't be taken by the categories or um, portfolios of risks that exist within a firm. Um, if a firm was large and had multiple departments, um, there's no reason why each department could not um, pursue this exercise, which then aggregates and Speeds up to the uh, to the top levels. So within a particular department, say the IT department, it um, it may be uh, very easy to um, to basically come up with a load of specific to IT risks, um, and there may be a risk capacity allied to that um, that particular facet of the business. So yes, there's there's, there's absolutely no problem uh, doing that. It was simply one of um, of clarity of demonstration that we were still down. Great, and a second question we've had. How do you map the risks across to get a pillar two number? Yes, I, I, I have that. been yeah I've been mentioning ICAP quite a lot, so then this was uh, this was a question I thought may well may well come up. Um, the way I generally um, advise on this, a uh, fairly simplistic way and obviously it's open to uh, much more sophisticated treatment. But if you remember the consequences table, we basically had numbers one to five. Um, and if I remember rightly, number one was a, a negligible, con um, negligible consequence, and it was about 500 pounds, um, going all the way up to substantial, which I think in our model was uh, 200,000 plus. Now, my view would be that within each category, um, you would look to the maximum consequence or maximum impact risk within that category. Um, and by using that as your provision, um, you have, by definition, um, covered all the smaller or less consequential um, risks. It would uh, seem to be a fairly uh, straightforward um, mapping. Uh, you know, obviously, a firm could use some sort of gearing on that, perhaps two times, uh, two times the largest, just to be safe. But um, basically, that 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 would be the the initial approach. The one thing to note, of course, is um, that the uh, the substantial category five was actually two hundred thousand pounds plus. Um, this is because the the highest risk category is, is to a certain extent unbound at its at its upper level. Um, these are things that could be catastrophic to a business, um, and it may be that from the point of view of pillar two provisioning, you would take the um, you would just take the lower bound 
that because if an, you know, an absolutely catastrophic event does occur, it's very likely that the firm's business, day-to-day -day business as usual, would cease um, and all of its capital, available and deployable capital, would probably be put to, to addressing this problem. So at that point, you're, you're going through a, a, an almost a singularity um, where this model ceases to be applicable. The business has completely changed as a result of this, uh, this event. Um, but yes, I, I would I would use the category maximums as uh, as your provisioning um, your provisioning tool. Great. Um, another another question we have here: Is risk capacity um, quantifiable? Gerard, that's 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 one for me. Uh, risk, um, I'd say risk management um, capability um, is it quantifiable. You can infer it. You can infer your capability from your key performance indicators and your key risk indicators. Um, let, me, let me give you a couple of examples. Uh, if your outstanding debt is high, it might uh, point to poor credit control. Let's put it the other way around. If you have good credit control and your, your uh, bad debt and your outstanding debt is low, then you can probably take on more risk in that area in terms of taking on um, more people who you give credit to so you have more capacity for risk there but if your band debt is high uh, then either your capability is poor or, or your uh, some some controls and picking the people you give credit to are, are poor um, your system uptime if you take an IT one if it's if it's good if it's uh, up in two three nines 99.9 then um, obviously doing something right. Whereas if you're having continuous errors and failures and outages on your IT systems, that might point to aged systems or um, poorly trained IT people. Uh, I think your incident reports is, is, is uh, probably your best indicator. Um, and certain, certainly there have been books written about the financial crisis and one of them I, by Michael um, Barnier, said that if the banks had been recording the incidents, all of them, they would have had the red flags much sooner and they would have seen it going, going awry. So your incidents report, risk events, whatever you want to call them, they will tell you a lot about what's working and what's not working. So to answer your question, I think it is uh, quantifiable, um, but probably not in one, uh, one measure. Right. Thank you very much. I'll just wait a moment to see if any more questions come in. Um, whilst I'm waiting to see if any more come in, as you can see in the bottom left of your screen at the moment, you've got both Gerard's and Richard's email address. Please, could you, if you would like a copy of the slides, please could you email either one of them and they can send the slides across to you. Um, as we're coming up to the end of the session, this is all the time we have for today. Um, thank you very much for joining us on the second part of the Risk Adequacy um, Seminar today. I uh, hope you enjoyed and learned something. Again, please email those emails at the bottom left-hand corner of the screen there to get a copy of the slides. And if you have any questions, please email them um, through after the session is finished. Um, Rich and George, do you have anything left to say to conclude on that? Um, yes, um, we are hoping to run a third instalment um, on this risk adequacy series on the 5th of December, um, where Gerard and I will be looking at how you implement this process and embed it within a business. Um, we've looked at the, uh, the technical means um, and some of the concepts, but clearly uh, actually getting this uh, up and running within a business requires um, you know, an, an, a, number of, uh, a number of participants to buy into it. So we'll, we'll um, take you through that in, uh, in the next installment. Fantastic. Well, um, thank you very much for everyone for joining us today. And looking forward to having you with us at the beginning of December. Thank you very much, all. Um, thank you all. Goodbye. Have a good day. Goodbye. Bye-bye.